Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you for coming out again this evening. It's good to see you. And we give you a special welcome in the name of the Lord. And if you're watching at home online, the welcome is extended to you as well. And hope you should be blessed as we come together this evening. We're glad to have Stephen Walker with us this evening as our speaker. And Stephen has been with us before. We've enjoyed his ministry. That's why he's back. And <laughs> if you do a good job, you maybe get back again, Stephen. So we're going to stand and sing a great hymn. If you can stand, please do. Blessed assurance, the great hymn of testimony. And uh, let's sing this hymn with all our heart. Great time of testimony. Let's just come before the Lord and ask for his blessing and help in our gathering this evening. Let's just pray together. Gracious Father, again, we thank you that so many of us this evening have this song, that Jesus is our Savior because of what he has accomplished at Calvary, and he brought us into his family. We thank you, Lord, for this again, another opportunity to come into your presence we don't take it lightly, we don't take it for granted, but we thank you for the great privilege it is as ours to come and address the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the one who, at his words, spoke everything into existence. And we thank you that when you spoke it into existence, you said it was good. And Lord, the pinnacle of your creation was mankind, and you said it was very good. But Lord, we have strayed from you, we have turned our own way. Adam sought for more. 
but got less than he expected because he lost that relationship he had with you through sin. And for each one of us, because we're sons of Adam, are born in sin and shaped in iniquity, and we need a saviour. We thank you that you came into this world to be that saviour of the world, to take a punishment that was due to each one of us in your own body on that tree. And we thank you for that day and hour when so many of us came and fell in love with the Saviour and acknowledged our sinful state and our need of you as our Saviour. So, Father, we just thank you for this privilege that is ours. And we just think of so many tonight who, of our members, our family members and friends and neighbours and friends who don't know you, pray that our lives may tell for you in these days in which we live that we see something of the beauty of Christ in our lives. For this meeting tonight, Lord, we thank you that you've brought us here. Thank you for Stephen and for his ministry in the past. And we pray that as he opens again your word this evening, that you would bless him in his own soul. And that as we sit and listen, we too might be blessed in our souls. And we might go from this place this evening, knowing that it was indeed good for us to be here. For here we met with the living God. So, Father, hear our prayer. And not only for this place, but for every other centre where your word will be faithfully proclaimed this evening, that they too might know the blessing of God, and that we might see men and women, boys and girls, come to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this may be a great night in heaven over sinners repenting, because we pray in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Now, just one or two announcements. At the end of the service this evening, we have a cup of tea or coffee, so we don't run away. Get, stay and have some fellowship with us and then tomorrow night, Tuesday night and Wednesday night we're having three evenings of prayer for the ongoing work and the fellowship here notice the time change from 8 o'clock to 7.30 and the reason for the time change is that some people last year said it was too late getting home at 9 o'clock so we do not to take any excuses away from you from coming to prayer we come at half past seven tomorrow night and join with us for our times of prayer. And all these announcements are subject to the will of the Lord. And the pastor will be back tomorrow, so you mark your card if you're not here. <laughs> We're going to sing another great hymn, and that's the assurance we sang as we testimony hymn. And we have that assurance because our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ. And that's our next hymn, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. And if you can, we'll stand to sing this as good as well.
want just to take a few moments now to pray for those folks in the fellowship and others who are known to us who are not just so well. Just heard this evening from Stephen that Billy Colville, who served the association for so many years, isn't very well at the minute and needs our prayers. We just remember Billy Colville as well. Let's just pray together. Gracious Father, again we come into your presence and we thank you that you're a God of compassion, a God who cares of each one of us. And so many of our fellowship are in need of you this evening. Many of them are sick. Many of them are worried about hospital appointments or hospital uh, decisions that have been made or they have to make in the future. Many are family issues and family worries. And Lord, we just commit them lovingly to you and ask that whatever the situation they find themselves in right now, they might know that abiding presence. You've promised to be closer than hands and feet and stick closer than a brother. So even whenever the difficult times arise, as we were hearing this morning, we have a refuge in you that we can take shelter from the times of storm. And we thank you that, Lord, you are the master of the winds. You control the storms on the Sea of Galilee. And we thank you that you can still the storms that each one of us face in our individual situations. Because you're the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And though we think of Billy Colville, particularly this evening, we thank you for the many years of dedicated service he gave to the Baptist Union of Ireland and the Association of Churches. Lord, we just commit him lovingly to you now. He needs your help. We just pray, Lord, that you would touch him. And Lord, we pray that you would bring him through this difficult time. Pray for his family as well, that they might know the peace of God, which passes all understanding. And so, Lord, we just commend our service again to you and ask for your help. As Stephen would come in a short time to read your word and to expound it to us, that Jesus might be exalted and glorified as a result of our time of worship this evening because we pray in his name and for his sake and glory alone. Amen. Now before Stephen comes to read and to sing, we're going to stand, uh, read and preach. He's not going to sing, he's going to preach. (laughs) Well, anyway, step of the tongue, but we'll we'll stand and sing together. Uh, Jesus shall take the highest honour. Because he has done so much for us, he deserves the place of highest honour. So that's what we're going to sing that tonight. We want to give him that highest honour in our lives day by day. So let's just stand, if you can, and sing this great hymn together. Yes, you definitely wouldn't want me singing, I can tell you that. I'm not even allowed to sing in the shower at home, so that tells you how bad my singing is. But it is good to be back, it's good to have another opportunity to preach the word of truth.
to God's people. And I was saying to Alfie, I'm working in full-time employment. I was, uh, worked for Every Home Crusade for almost five years and left there and went to the Baptist College. I was the year above Neil. That's how I got to know Neil, although his uncle Harry Ray was my pastor at the time in Lisburn Congregational Church. And being there the first year of the preparation for ministry course in the college, got to make some really good friends. And through there, I went to my placement in a congregational church in Balmahinch and then left there. And I had five years as a pastor in a little church in a wee village, a coal mining village in East Ayrshire called New Cumnock. And we had to leave there because my father-in-law was unwell. So we had to give up our post and come home. And I've been working in secular employment from I come home. That's just a little bit of background to who I am. But if you have your Bible with you, I'll ask you to turn to the Old Testament and to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. We're going to read the first 20 verses together. Isaiah chapter 1. And as we come to the Word of God, I, I usually say as we have sit with our Bibles open, that this is the only part of the service for which we can claim infallibility. The hymns of wor- worship and praise we have been singing are man written, are man word this. They might be scripturally based, which many of them are. The sermon are my thoughts hopefully backed up by Scripture. But as we come to the word of the true and the living God, this is the only part of this service that is infallible. So let's hear what God has to say to us as as we read from Isaiah chapter 1. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, <coughs> Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. A sinful nation. A people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been clothed or closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate, your cities are burned with fire, your land strangers devour it in your presence, and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Sion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of the fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. 
when ye, when ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to, treat, to tread my courts, bring no more vile ob- oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the callings of assemblies, I cannot away with it. It is in iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Amen. And we ask God to bless the reading of his word to our hearts. Let's pray for a moment before we turn to God's word. Our Father, we thank you for this word of truth. We thank you that it is a living word. And Lord, We thank you that it is a speaking word. It can speak into the hearts of men and women, boys and girls. And, oh, Lord, it is a revealing word because it reveals Christ and it reveals to us our great need of him. So, Lord, tonight, as we seek to hear from you, our prayer would be that we would have ears to hear all that you have to say to us, that we would have hearts that have been prepared to receive your word, And that, O Lord, that our lives would be ready to apply that word and to take it into the week that lies ahead for your glory and for your honour. Amen. Amen. The reason I give a little bit of an introduction about who I am and to say that I'm in secular employment is because of the opportunities that I'm afforded working in a factory. You know, when I went in to, to work, I started as an agency worker and I was in and I was working and I was working away and this guy came over and started working beside me and he says what did you do before you come in here and I said well for 12 years I was a a minister in two different churches well the look of shock and horror on his face as he stepped away in silence and hardly spoke for the rest of the day But as I've worked there, people have opened up. They've seen that I am not some type of freak, as Christians are portrayed in today's society, but they've seen that I'm semi-normal. And I actually end up now on a Friday afternoon from Easter time through, when the weather affords it, which hasn't been great this year, go out and play golf with two of the guys that I actually work with. But a few weeks ago, as we were sitting in the canteen on a Monday morning, one of the guys said something astounding. He said, why do we never need to be taught to do things that are wrong? How is it that doing the wrong thing, doing the dishonest thing, seems to come so natural to us? When, and yet doing something that is good and is right is hard to do. Of course, different people shared a few comments. But as the cups of tea were sat down, he turned to me and he said, Stephen, what's your answer to this? And so, after a few seconds to gather my thoughts, I replied, well... Each and every one of us is born with a rebellious and a disobedient streak within us. We are all born 
with this disobedience. But you know, that's not how it was supposed to be. Of course, Adrian facing me, he says, Ha, here comes today's sermon. Well, little did he know. But uh, I just went on to say, you know, when God first created man in the Garden of Eden, everything was perfect. In fact, he said everything was very good. And man knew nothing of disobedience or rebellion at this time. But once Adam succumbed to the temptations of Satan in the garden, disobedience and rebellion then became part of man's makeup. And from that time on, everyone who has ever been born, apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, has been born with a sinful, fallen nature. And a few texts of Scripture just popped into my mind. I wasn't sure of their where they came from, but I was able to fire them out. I just said, the Bible says, Behold, we are shaping in iniquity and in sin, and our mothers conceive us. It says in the book of Romans that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And in Romans later on it says, Wherefore by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And then another verse came to me. And it's a verse that can bring comfort to us who are Christians tonight. It's a verse that can bring comfort to us as we face the the daily battle against the world, the flesh, and the devil. But it's a verse that can bring challenge to someone who is not a Christian. It's a verse that can challenge the heart of someone who is lost. But it's a verse that tells us there is hope. There is hope in the midst of sin. It's found in verse 18 of the passage that we've just read. It says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You know, that verse tells us that even in the midst of our sin, there's the hope of forgiveness. Or as I have entitled this evening's message, there is a call of grace. This call of grace is a call that has gone out Through the ages. It is a call that has been offered by this holy God since the fateful day of the fall. And possibly one of the greatest pictures of this call of grace is seen as Noah and his sons toiled away for 120 years building that ark even though the people had never, ever seen rain. And, you know, with each clang of his hammer, with every tree that was fell, the call of grace rang out. But as it rang out, it went ignored. For instead of heeding the warning that was being offered by God, the people mocked Noah and his sons. They mock God and they continue to live in their rebellion and in their disobedience. And just as God had promised, the rains came. And those who were outside of the ark were wiped out. But as soon as the flood water subsided, The rebellious streak that is within the heart of every man came to the fore once again. And although God has not severely judged man or the earth since that day, one day, one day very, very soon he will come again and he will pour out his wrath upon this sinful world. 
And because God is going to come and pour out his wrath on the sinful world, we all need to be ready for that great and terrible day. We need to be ready. And the only way that we can be ready is by heeding the call of grace that's being offered. The only way we can be ready is by surrendering our hearts and our lives to the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way to be ready is to have your rebellion and your disobedience dealt with and covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And tonight I want us to look at this section of scripture. And although it was written a long, long time ago, and it was written to the nation of Israel, I believe that we can take it and we can apply its its warnings to ourselves as Christians and to our world and those who are in it. You know, today, if, you, if you're chatting to people on the street, door-to-door work or, or wherever, they'll tell you the Bible's irrelevant. It's outdated. But even reading this passage, do we not see that it's actually buying up to date? It may not be for the nation of Israel, but it's for the world. It's buying up to date. It speaks of our world and the state of our world even today. And so what I want to do is to to look, first of all, at how it applies to the world. I want to see how it applies to the world. As As I've said, we need to remember that the nation of Israel, to whom this is written, was God's chosen nation. Out of every nation in the world, God had chosen them to be his. And he had blessed them time and time again. And each time they had received a blessing, they were thankful, but for a short time. And then they they turned away in rebellion. And because of this, Isaiah tells us that God called them, in verse 4, a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. And then he went even further. As if that wasn't bad enough, he went on to say, they have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They're gone away backward. Can you just imagine having this thrice holy God saying that about your nation? But the reality is, he could say that about our nation today, couldn't he? He could say that about our world today. Because we are a sinful people. The world's full of sin. There's so much iniquity. There's so many evildoers. So many corruptors in the world today. You see, we have been blessed way beyond anything we deserve. But yet the majority in the world are still living in rebellion. If you look at verse 5, he says, he doesn't stop there. Why should you be stricken? Why should you be struck down anymore? You will revolt. As long as I leave this, you will revolt more and more. And then he says the whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. And basically what God is saying to the nation of Israel and what he's saying to the world today is the more corrupt, the more rebellious and the more disobedient you become, the angrier I'm getting. He says, the more blessings that you receive from my ever-giving hand, and Alfie has referred to that in his prayers, you know, the more blessings we receive, the truth is, the more that people reject God and God's ways. He says, from the, the sole of the foot even onto the head, there's no soundness in it. 
but wounds and bruises and purifying sores. And what he means is from the lost in society right through to the very heads of state. Here he's talking of the the high priests and the government officials. He says corruption is abounding. He's describing the nation of Israel as being like an infected wound. A wound that needs cleansing. And as Christians, when we look at our world today, with all of its political corruption, with its neglect of God, with and the neglect of God's standards, couldn't we just describe the world in the very same way? This world is putrid. It is rotten because sin abounds. And it's nearly as if the greater sinner you are, the more blessings and the more benefits you receive. But things can't go on that way forever. Things can't go on like that forever. And soon God will tire of this world's neglect of him. And one day he will come in judgment. This book, the book of truth, that's what it tells us. He will come in judgment. Do you know in Psalm 1 it says that God sits in the heavens and laughs. People don't get that. People think that they are in control. They laugh at Christians when, when we say that God's coming soon and there's going to come in judgment. They laugh. But the reality is, according to the book of Psalms, that God sits in heavens and laughs because he knows the final outcome. But the reason that people have this, this type of attitude is because... They have robbed God of his position. I am 61 later this year. And I grew up going to Sunday school. And sometimes when I look at the world, I think I was the last generation where everyone went to Sunday school. But there was a respect for God. But there's no respect for God today. People have stripped God of his position. They have removed him from his his throne in heaven. They have stripped him of any authority whatsoever. And their attitude is, I will do whatever I want. Isn't that the attitude of the world today? And as as Christians, if you you try to preach, if you try to, to challenge people, they mock you, they laugh at you, they make fun of you. There's no fear, there's no reverence of God. You see, people today don't see God as the moral ruler that he is. They believe that they can live their lives doing and saying just whatever they want without ever having to face any consequences for their actions. But the reality is, as Christians, we shouldn't be surprised by that at all. Because that is the mindset of the nation of Israel. That's what we see here in this passage. They're doing whatever they feel like doing. It's like going back to the, the book of Judges when man shall do whatever's right in his own eyes. See here the nation of Israel, just like the world today, they believe that God would watch over them and bless them no matter what. But that is not how it works. That's not how it works. You see, God is faithful. He's faithful. But in return, he expects worship. He expects praise. He expects some faithfulness from his people in return. 
And as Isaiah writes, Israel are going through a time of judgment. Because verse 7 tells us, Your country is desolate, your cities are burned with fire, your land strangers devour it in your presence. He says there's nothing good left in the land. That land that was flowing of milk and honey. That land that was promised to Abraham so long ago. He says, I gave it to you, but you haven't looked after it. And now the surrounding nations have taken it all. And when he says, and the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage and a vineyard, as a lodge and a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. What he's saying is that as a nation, you have nothing. You have nothing. You're like that lonely shed that sits out in the middle of the vineyard that's only used at harvest time and is neglected for the rest of the year. And this really is a description of the world. Because without God, the world has nothing to offer. The world has nothing to offer. Because it's him that controls the wind. It's him who is in control of the sunshine and the rain. It's him who sends the harvest. He is in control. And people in the world, though, they they seek to find fulfillment in so many things. But as believers in Christ, do we not know that the only fulfillment is found in Jesus Christ? You see, the world seeks, they try this and they try that. To fill the void in their heart, but yet Jesus is the only thing that fills it. You see, people neglect him because they don't realize that it is him who holds their very next breath in the palm of his hand. It's him and it is him alone that knows their end from their beginning. You know, just this past week, I got called that my my mum had had a stroke about October time last year. She had had a second one, but she has a very sore right leg. And she was at the physio and she collapsed. And the physio was worried that there was a clot in her leg because of the pain she was having. And they rushed around. Thankfully, she was in the Lagan Valley Hospital. They got around and they were able to check her out. And all was clear. But as the doctor said, I'm worried you might have a clot. And if it moves to your lung, we don't know what we'll be able to do. And my mum, she just said, well, you know, I'm ready to go. If it's God's time, it's the right time. My heart has so many beats. and When that number's reached, that's it. The doctor looked at her in shock and in horror at her attitude. And she just said, you know, I trust that Jesus Christ will do what is right. And the doctor just looked. And I thought to myself, that's a great attitude to have. I wonder would I have that type of attitude, that type of spirit, If I was in her position, I don't know. But yet, she knew that her next breath was in the hand of him who gave himself for her on Calvary. You see, it's him and it's him alone that knows the end from the beginning. And more and more people need to realize that. You see, it's in him and in him alone that we we live and move and have our being. 
our times are in his hands. And people can neglect him. And maybe tonight you're here and you are neglecting God. People can even ignore him. And maybe tonight you are. But this ignorance and this neglect is only for a season. Because one day, each and every one of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, as Paul tells us in Romans 10, 14. One day, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. See, the world is rebellious, and disobedient towards God's glory. But the church of Jesus Christ has a responsibility to tell those of their error. And that's the second thing that's spoken of here in our text. For amongst those who are rebellious and disobedient is a remnant of God's people. Look at verse 9. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been a Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. So we've thought about the people. Let's think now about the church. You see, as a remnant left in the sinful world, the church, you and me, have a great responsibility. But how has the church lived up to that responsibility? How has the church lived up to this great responsibility? We'll ask many church leaders, and they'll tell you, it's done okay. It's done okay. Because the world is not as bad as it could be. But surely we have to ask, Has the church really done okay? And this is when it gets a little bit controversial. This is when it gets challenging because we all like to think that our church, our fellowship has done well. We like to think that we have all done our little bit for God. And as Baptists, along with the other non-conformists, we've done okay. We have. We've done okay. But we could have done more. We could have done more. You see, the world today is full of spiritual apostasy. The world's full of spiritual apostasy. And in many churches, if we can even call them churches, and I'm sure you have many in this town, the same as we have in Lisburn, God has been portrayed, if I can say this reverently, as a toothless old man with a long beard, sitting on a fluffy cloud. In some churches or some buildings, He's seen as someone that is simple, senile, and sentimental. He's spoken of as someone that is overwhelmed with so much love that it just continually pours out on all the people. God is seen as someone that loves all things, and so he wouldn't even swat a little fly in case he heard it. And that is how God is portrayed in some fellowships or some buildings. But that's not how the Bible portrays God. The Bible clearly teaches us that one day he is going to judge the world once and for all. Yes, he is a God of love. And that seems to be The main focus. But he is a God of wrath. He is a God of wrath. We've already thought about how he judged the world before with Noah. 
We have to think how he poured out his wrath upon his own son on the cross at Calvary. And here in verse 10 it says, Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. Oh, world, you need to listen to what God's saying. You see, the call of the church and to the church should be get back to the Bible. Get back to the truth of God's word. And don't worry about offending people. And that's what's wrong with today. Too many people are worried about offending. But the word of God is offensive. It's challenging. It challenges me as a believer, as someone who loves God. It challenges my heart every time I read it. And I hope as a believer tonight, it challenges your heart. It wants you to ask the question, am I living as I should be living for God in this world? But if you're not saved tonight, I want you to know that our God is a God of love, yes, and he loves you, and he wants you to come to him, and he wants you to confess your sin, and he wants you to, to walk with him daily. But he's a God of wrath. He's a God of wrath. And if you don't accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, one day you're going to stand before him in judgment. You see, my attitude, and I think the attitude of all Christians should be, that it's better to offend with the truth and see someone end up in glory than to comfort them with lies and to ultimately see them enter hell for all eternity. It's better to offend with the truth and to see someone enter glory than to comfort with the truth and to see them enter hell for eternity. And what we should notice here from the text of Scripture is that although the nation of Israel were living in rebellion, they were still actually carrying out some of the rituals and worship that they were called to do. That's what we're told in verses 11 and 12. And how many churches in, in Cumber and in the surrounding area and in Lisbon and the surrounding area where I come from, oh, they have their services where they, at Christmas and at Easter and their harvest service and they bring and they come and the churches get people in. And the rest of the year, there's nothing. But when the people do come into these places, there's no truth taught. The word of God is neglected. You see, these people in this passage, they were doing what they thought was right. We'll bring our sacrifices. We will offer them to God. But God says, I hate them. I hate them. Bring no more feign oblations or sacrifices. Incense is an abomination unto me, he says. Verse 14, my soul hateth, they are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. You see, God knew that there was no sincerity in their worship. God knew their hearts. He knew that they were doing these things out of ritual rather than out of desire. He knew that they they were only doing these things because they wanted God's blessing, rather than because they wanted to offer him worship and praise. And isn't that why some go to church today? They want the blessings of God without surrendering themselves to God. Do you know people like that who they go to church every Sunday and they think, whenever God comes, I'll be fine. I will be okay. But they're going to churches where the word of God is read, but it is not faithfully explained. It's not faithfully proclaimed. 
They go to places where they hear a story rather than a sermon. I was in one of these places recently at a a christening of a a, a friend. His, His young baby was getting christened and we were invited. There was an Old Testament reading. There was a New Testament reading. And my brain immediately kicked in. How are they going to tie these two passages of Scripture together? Where's, what brings them? And I thought, this could be interesting. But the minister got up and for 20 minutes he gave us a history lesson about the mill that used to be down the road that was now an apartment block. God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, never, never mentioned You see, people were given a history lesson and they were being told how good they were rather than how bad they are. They were told about a building rather than their need of repentance and their turning to God. You see, ultimately, that is what God wants. God wants people to repent. He wants people to to come to him. He wants worship. He wants praise. He wants our adoration. He doesn't want people standing in pulpits giving history lessons about mills and so forth. He wants his word taught. And that just brings us very quickly into our our third and our final point. Because we've had the the church. Now we've got the people. For despite the rebellion and the disobedience of the nation of Israel, of the world, and of the church, God wants people to turn to him. Look at what he says. And here's the call of grace. Why you, verses 16 and 7, why you make you clean Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widows. You see, despite the rebellion, despite the disobedience, God offers a call of grace. If you will put away your evil doings from before mine eyes, if you will just change your ways, I will help you. I can help you. And he says in verse 18, Come now and let us reason together. Come. Come and confess your sin. Let's reason. Let's talk about them. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Oh, what a comforting verse. What a comforting verse of Scripture this is. What a call of grace this is. Here we have God. And he's saying, no matter what you have done in the past, come and talk to me. My ear is ever open. Come and confess unto me. Because no no matter what your sin is, I can make you clean. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white. Us know. There is grace offered to all who call upon the name of the Lord. Whether that be a country, whether that be a nation, whether that be a church, whether that be an individual person. The Lord Jesus Christ Himself. He put it this way in Matthew 11, 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. 
and I will give you rest. The rest that Jesus Christ offers is not freedom from sin in this life, but it is victory over sin in the life to come. You see, the call of grace is an offer of pardon. It's an offer of purity. It is God saying, by nature you're stained, you're marked, you're guilty. But I can remove your stain. I can purify and cleanse you forever. And that cleansing is done through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only hope for this world. He is the only hope for the church. He's the only hope for the people. The people who are stained with sin. And as a church here, you need to keep your light shining bright. You need to protect your gospel witness. You need to be proclaiming the truth because there are so many other buildings, so-called churches, who are molly-coddling people and they're not telling, they're not preaching the truth. Give thanks that you have a faithful pastor Someone who preaches the truth. And I'm sure, in fact, I know that he gives thanks for you who support him and uplift him in his prayers, in your prayers, as he seeks to proclaim the truth in his life. We should be thankful that we have a message to proclaim. And we should be willingly taking it to the people, to the world outside. You see, here God says that if there is repentance, that you will be blessed. It says in verse 19, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. In other words, there are untold blessings for all who repent of their sin and place their faith and trust in Christ. As Christians tonight, we are blessed abundantly more than we can ever ask or think. The blessings of this world are good. They're great. But the blessing that is to come, when we will be with him in heaven for all eternity, is the greatest blessing of all. And so tonight as a Christian, as a a believer, are you rejoicing in Christ and all that he has done for you? Are you looking forward to receiving the blessings of an eternal home in heaven with him? I hope and I pray that you are rejoicing in Christ every moment of every day. But verse 20 warns that if you refuse and rebel ye shall be devoured with the sword. If you're not saved tonight, if you're coming here, you know the truth, you have heard the truth proclaimed. But if you refuse to obey it, if you want to continue in your rebellion and your disobedience, then you will be devoured by the sword. One day you will stand before God in judgment. You see, without repentance, we're warned that heaven is a place where we will not be. It's a place we will not see. There are untold blessings for those who repent. But there is a place of darkness and despair for those who refuse. And don't have to take my word for it, because verse 20 closes with a stark, stark comment. It's not the word of Stephen Walker, for it says, the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. And so you may be challenged tonight. The challenge hasn't come from the preacher. The challenge has come from the Lord himself. 
the one who requires your repentance. You see, the greatest blessing is an eternal home in heaven with Christ. But without repentance, we are warned that heaven is a place we will not see. And this is not the word of a foolish preacher. Don't be offended by me. The word of the Lord hath spoken it. But be thankful that there is a call of grace offered. And I pray tonight, if you're not saved, that you will accept it. Rather than reject it, that you'll call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. I hope and I pray that the Lord will bless these thoughts to your heart. And if you're not saved, that the Lord will challenge your heart even before you go home tonight. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the challenge that has gone out from it. We pray as believers that we would live in light of this challenge and that we would go forward for your honor and your glory. We pray tonight if there is someone in the meetings, stranger to grace and to God, that they would accept this call of grace and that they would bow the knee in repentance. They would cast off their rebellion and their disobedience, and they would come in saving faith to the one who willingly sacrificed himself on the cross of Calvary for their sin. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're closing him. Amazing grace, how sweet the sign that saved a wretch like me. Let's stand as we offer praise unto God.
Our Father, we thank you for our fellowship around your word. Thank you for speaking to our hearts. And now, Father, for the fellowship we will enjoy around this cup of tea, we ask you to bless us together and bless us in your service. And soon as we depart from this place, we ask and we pray that grace and peace will be multiplied unto us all through the knowledge of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.